Excellent, thank you. So today's webinar is on supporting researchers on data management. Do we need a fairy godmother? So if that title sounds slightly mysterious, then hopefully all will, all will, all will become clear. Um, so really the core element of what we're aiming to discuss in this webinar is how should research da researchers, data management and skills be supported? So for example, should we focus on training researchers so that they can carry out good data management themselves? Or should we be funding specialist teams who can work with research groups to do this? So freeing up researchers time to focus on research. Um, so we have a number of researchers, PhD students, research support staff who are attending this webinar today. So it will be extremely interesting to gain your perspectives on this. And I think it is a slightly controversial topic. Um, so we welcome all wide range of opinions on this. So moving on to our speakers, we are very grateful to have our three fantastic speakers with us today um, who will be leading discussions on this. And I think what's really interesting is that we have perhaps three very different, perhaps not three, three very different perspectives, but people coming from three diff very different contexts. So we have the funders perspective, the perspective of the broader institution, and then we have somebody speaking more from the kind of, uh, sort of departmental um, ground roots level. So our first speaker today will be Tao Tao Chang, and Tao Tao is the Head of Infrastructure at AHRC, um, that's the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So this is one of the seven uh, research councils that falls within UKRI, UK Research and Innovation. And it's also one of the major funders of Arts and Humanities Research. Um, so Tata will be, find, will be providing the funders perspective on research data management support today, and we'll also be discussing current plans for investment as well. Um, I'm going to introduce all our speakers in one go now. Um, so our second speaker today will be Marta Teprek. Um, Marta is Head of Research Data Services at TU Delft Library in the Netherlands. And she's also Director of the 40U Research Data Repository. Um, and she was also formerly the Data Stewardship Coordinator at TU Delft. Marta is no stranger to the University of Cambridge. Uh, she conducted her PhD here and was subsequently instrumental in establishing research data services at Cambridge and also initiating the Data Champion programme um, together with colleagues at the OSC. So today Marta will be discussing how data management support can be provided by a combination of different approaches. And then last but not least, our final speaker of today will be Al Downey. And Al, Al is head of IT at the Gurdon Institute at the University of Cambridge. And this is a centre which spe specialises in developmental biology and cancer biology. Um, I also have to say that Al is also one of our esteemed Data Champion alumni <laughs> and is a very ad active advocate of good research data management. And so today I will be, provide a department level perspective and discuss infrastructure design and also changing research culture. So without further ado, I think we'll kick off with our first speaker, so Tao Tao Chang. So Tao Tao. Let's find the unmute button first before I go any further. Thank you very much, Sasha, and thank you all of you for, for, for coming. Um, um, my brief was to give the funder's perspective, um, and um, in the sort of best tradition of all policy wonks, I'm going to start with lots of caveats. So I'm going to give a funder's perspective, specifically the AHRC's perspective, um, on um, where we should, you know, the sorts of interventions that we might uh, and support that we might give um, to researchers to enable um, good um, research data management. Um, and I thought I'd start um, just by giving you a little bit of an overview of where AHRC stands and how we have got to this point and indeed how I ended up um, uh, being invited um, to speak to you today. So um, AHRC um, has, not, has, has not systematically funded um, um, sort of data curation um, of, it, of 
grants that it has funded since the AHDS, the Arts and Humanities Data Service, was um, decommissioned in 2008. Um, and at this point, a decision was taken that um, the uh, responsibility for managing research data from um, um, AHRC funded projects should fall with individual institutions. Um, when um, UKRI then launched its um, uh, infrastructure program in, in 2018, this, it was an opportunity, as it were, to reassess or reappraise um, um, this position. And um, we took the decision then to um, undertake a fairly extensive consultation with communities to ascertain or really to sort of determine where our fund, our, 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 um, where we should channel investment or what the areas of priority investment should be. And um, three priorities out of this, this sort of infrastructure exercise were, 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 were identified. One part was in cultural heritage, another in creative industries, but digital research infrastructure was an area that came up repeatedly as something that urgently needed um, intervention or support, particularly for arts and humanities. And so we've taken that on board. And in June this year, AHRC submitted um, a, a, an application, a bid to UKRI's new centrally hypothecated fund called the Infrastructure Fund. And um, we, we, we decided that you know, we, we'd taken on board from the community that the landscape was very, very um, fragmented, that support was extremely, and provision was extremely patchy, that there seemed to be uh, a, a, a quite a significant skills gap and uh, not exactly an unwillingness, but less understanding perhaps within the AHLC research community or the AH community about the value of, of, of good research data management. Um, so the, I, I can tell you a little bit about, you know, the sort of the key um, characteristics of the bid, although I, I can't really sort of go into enormous detail, but our priorities at that time were that first and foremost, there needed to be investment to prevent further data loss. Um, and, and that came across partly because, you know, data is not findable, research data gets lost, if you have projects that are funded on short-term on, on short funding, then after a particular point in, uh, you know, after two or three years, your institution or your home institution has no further obligation to host it. It's, it's not necessarily archived in a unified way. And then it, it gets lost. And that, that, that means that, it, that you know, research becomes inefficient and you, it, 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 you can't, it's also just be, makes, the job of researchers and funders more difficult. Um, so um, in terms of um, providing funding um, or, 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 or I don't, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, I should have used um, a, a PowerPoint. Um, so I, it, it, in terms of, of, of funding, we thought the best thing to do, what, what we thought one of the things that we really needed to concentrate on was to um, in, invest in skills and in building capability. And um, also um, we recognize that arts and humanities data, in, uh, um, research data is incredibly rich and um, has potential to contribute to other areas of, um, of, of research and, in, and innovation, which are not necessarily arts and humanities related. So in the area of heritage, for example, um, there is a huge need in within heritage and heritage in the built environment to create um, fairly complex digital twins that measure carbon capture and measure, uh, 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 and, 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 and measure, um, you know, or, or analyze um, the fabric of the building in quite a sophisticated way. And they, uh, particularly in archaeology and in the built environment, they are researcher needs driven by arts and humanities researchers, which also drive innovation in other sectors. So we've seen it as a sort of opportunity and the, 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 the three sort of main priorities were to prevent further data loss, data loss to um, build skills and to provide a framework in which um, 
institutions could be supported to build the skill and capacity and a, a, a greater understanding of the value and best, best practice across, across the community, and also therefore to build an ecosystem and, um, and, and um, sort of lead to a change in research culture or sustained change in research culture. So that is, as, I, as it were, the view from the AHRC at this point in time. Um, and unfortunately, as I said, I've had to caveat um, my, my, my presentation because there, there's a lot of information that is that I, I that I have to be quite careful about being specific about in a in a in a in a public setting, um, but I'll welcome questions later. Okay, thank you. And I think that your last point is entirely understandable. So thank you. I really appreciate your comments today. Um, I can think of questions I have already, but that's not the plan for today. <laughs> So um, I think, thank you so much, Tao I think, Marta, now, if you could um, begin your talk. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for inviting me. I hope you can now see my slides. Today I would like to tell you and share with you a couple of thoughts about investing in data support and how this might happen, the main topic of today's session. So my name is Marta Teperek. And uh, as introduced before, I'm the head of research data services at TU Delft in the Netherlands. And if you would like to get in touch with me later to discuss any of these issues I will be talking about, you are most welcome. I will give you my email address and my Twitter handle as well. So first of all, to start, I think that's a topic that you probably all know already since you already are here attended this webinar. But why should we care about good data management? There are multiple reasons and each person you would talk with, different researcher would give you different reasons. I wanted to tell you, share with you three reasons that are very commonly mentioned among our researchers and support staff at TU Delft. And the first one is time and efficiency saving. I think that's also what Tao Tao was mentioning. So if we share data effectively, if we manage data properly, if we can find them easily, that means that researchers spend less time struggling with data, aligning that, making data interoperable, finding data, and actually have much more time doing effective research based on that data. And here I wanted to share with you a quote from uh, one of the researchers who deposited their data with us. Uh, the mention was the usefulness of sharing our data is evident. The many emails with requests for event logs can easily be answered by giving the DOI of the data set. So if you make data available, it actually really removes a lot of workload from your site. Then secondly, more impact. So I think we are past the time when researchers only cared, I hope, that, about the PDF of the research paper as the representation of the broad research they have done. We have so much more than that, the data, the code, the methodology, the protocols, and so on. And they are all, and especially in the case of this talk, data and code are standalone research outputs which should be valued as well in equal rights to publications. And if you share data and code, you can really make fantastic new connections, new collaborations, because data and code become visible. So here again, a quote that I wanted to share with you from a researcher from TU Delft, that the amount of views shows that nearly all of the world's other research groups involved in experimental quantum mechanics have accessed the data set. That's the start. That's something that helps that research group to have greater recognition, more potential for collaboration. And surprisingly, some people say that if you share your data, if you make your data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, then perhaps you would deter companies from engaging with you. But actually, if you manage your data properly and professionally, if you document what you do, it's much easier to patent your research, your research innovation, and it's also easier to engage with third parties. And as an evidence of that, I would like to share with you a statement from a colleague from our valorization center, that's the university commercialization arm that we have at TU Delft. He said that proper data management and documentation makes our job, their job, much easier when it comes to patenting and commercialization and proving who did what and when. So here is a statement from somebody who really cares about monetizing research. So I hope I convinced you of those three arguments that good data management is clearly beneficial and important. So what's the problem? The problem is that good data management is not yet common practice. 
And here I would like to share with you outcomes of a survey done on 8,500 researchers in 2019 by Digital Sciences. And in that survey, they were asked how familiar they were with FAIR principles for research data. FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. It turned out only 18% of researchers were familiar with them. That probably suggests that even lower percentage of researchers were actually putting those principles into practice. So interesting finding to keep in mind, I think. And why is that? And I hope some of that, especially some of the researchers in here would agree with that, that good data management, taking time to document data, taking time to develop a new workflow to properly manage your data, to document your code, to annotate your code, to do proper version control, that all takes a lot of time and effort and very often also requires a lot of knowledge and skills. It's not only you have to be willing to do that, but you also have to know how to do that. What are the disciplinary standards for metadata in my field, for example? How do I implement those standards in practice? And while I think that the job, of course, researchers should know more about how to manage their data, why it's important, I think that's really unfair if researchers are asked to do it alone and are not supported in that task. So what I'm really uh, advocating is that researchers should be supported in good data management. And how to do that? Today, I would like to tell with you a case study from TU Delft, Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands, where I'm based, and what we did to try to help researchers uh, with their data management, to give them that extra support. So the starting point uh, is that we were already privileged to have a strong central data support team which consists of about 12 uh, full-time employees who manage the data repository at our university, who provide training, who help to develop policy and advocacy. The problem here, however, it turned out that it's not enough. Researchers wanted to have more disciplinary focused advice, more guidance, which is more tailored to their workflows and their practices. If you are a central team, you already have enough of work on your plate and you probably are not able to know exactly what different research communities are doing, what their problems are, what are the best tools and workflows you should be recommending to each one of them. So to tackle this problem, we decided to start a pilot for data stewards at our university. How it all started that in the year 2017-2018, there was a central university funding in recognition of the strategic importance of data management for the university to appoint one data steward at every faculty for three years. And the agreement was that after that three years pilot expires, the faculty will then have to decide how they wish to proceed, whether they wish to keep that data steward because they find them valuable members of staff or whether they don't think that's a good idea and they want to do something else. That's up to them to decide. So during these years of the pilot, data stewards were providing researchers with disciplinary support and advice on data management. Importantly, at the same time, they were reporting directly to faculty senior executives on what their job is, what do they do, what kind of questions they are coming from researchers, how are they solving those problems. And what I'm pleased to say that by now we are in 2020, that's almost the end of the pilot, that all the data stewards are appointed or are in the process of being appointed as permanent members of faculty staff from faculty budgets. And I think that's the best demonstration that those people who were initially put in place as three year, let's say, experiment were really valued by the faculties to the extent that the faculties decided to offer them permanent contracts. So we are very happy about that. In addition, Researchers realized that we need more granular hands-on support. So while a data steward, one person per faculty can give a lot of good advice on disciplinary practices, some researchers thought I would like actually someone to help me to implement this advice into practice. So what we are doing now, we are starting a new pilot as of summer this year on Digital Competency Center which is again uh, funding for two years from the central university budget and we have hired two data managers and four research software engineers who are able to provide hands-on support to researchers with data management and with research software engineering questions. That's basically a central pool of experts which are available to work with research groups for up to six months up to two days per week. 
researchers fill in an application, that's a competitive process. Successfully awarded projects get this team of experts to help them raise their data management practices to a new level. So to summarize what I just mentioned, we have three different levels of support available at TU Delft. We have the central support that are providing discipline agnostic support to all the researchers. So for example, managing the repository, providing generic training on data management, helping with communication. And that's coming from the central library budget. We also have the faculty level support, the data stewards who are providing disciplinary advice to researchers at their faculties. They all have disciplinary background in that area of research of the faculty. And that comes from the faculty budget. And in addition to that, we are also now investing into more granular support in the form of data manager and research software engineers who work directly with research groups and help them with data management and research software engineering tasks. And that's a mixture of central funding on that pilot that I have mentioned, the pool of experts, plus grant-based funding. And what I'm also pleased to say that thanks to that advocacy efforts of our data stewards, more and more researchers increasingly are asking in the grant proposal for dedicated funding for data managers or research software engineers to join their research groups. So my final message, I would certainly recommend everyone to invest in data support. It will certainly pay back. You will have an interested, enthusiastic research community and much more efficient research practices. So that really works. Thank you so much. That's all from me. And if you have any questions, I will be delighted to try to answer them or you can drop me an email later on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna, cause we actually have plenty of time. I'm just gonna, hijack hijack the end and just ask ask you also about i know you're not calling them data champions anymore but you also have a whole an additional layer to build onto that so i think it might be helpful to hear about that because sometimes data stewards you have a very efficient um distinct role clear role of what a data steward is but often that term is used quite loosely in different contexts and it can also get complained to the data champions as well um, because everyone has different names for these things. So I'd really love it if you could just say a little bit about that side of the community as well. Of course. So indeed, you are very right. And I think you have the Data Champions program here at the University of Cambridge. I have to admit, we have uh, taken your, your lead and we have repeated the same program at the Delft, which now Did sort you of evolved. You initiated it, so you're not taking the lead. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so that the Data Champions, these were researchers who are very passionate about good data management or open science or research software engineering. They are just simply doing that because they are the leaders in the field. So our idea behind the Data Champions was to provide that extra credit to those people who are already doing good practices, but are appointed as researchers or sometimes support staff at the university to do a different job. The primary job is not to do good data management or research software engineering, but anyway, to raise their profile, to showcase their example towards the others. So basically in a way to say a thank you and to showcase their case studies to the other people to be inspired. But the difference for us, and if that's of interest, I would be happy to share with you. We have a little explanation of those different job profiles that we have at TU Delft, is that those other roles that I was talking about, they are all appointed to do just that specific job. So in this case, the data steward is just working as a data steward. A data manager is there to just work as a data manager. Research software engineer, their primary job is to do research software engineering, not to do research. They complement each other. They work in, we sometimes use this phrase in the Netherlands, team science. Not everybody has the same skills. People might have different preferences, different capacities. Together, we make the research process much more efficient. I don't know, Sasha, if it answers your question. No, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, we've got a few questions that have come in already, but we'll leave those to the end. So, Al, if you could speak now, it'd be fantastic. Thank you. I think you are muted. It's okay. I'm a great head of IT, I am. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so I was just saying how, how much I've enjoyed um, the talks that I've managed to see in the last few days, and I, I'm enjoying this format. I think it's great, like bite-sized conferencing. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so we've heard about um, the importance of making sure that appropriate resources are available and about the value of a highly visible um, and proactive support structure. And they're both absolutely essential, of course, and thank goodness for Tao Tao and Marta and to everyone else who's working hard to enable researchers to improve their practices and to, to adopt better data management approaches. Um, infrastructure is another important pillar in the building of a successful data management culture. And people who know me will know that round about now, I normally start rabbiting on about the extravagance of duplicating infrastructure and services across the research landscape. And, um, and about the benefits of providing data management tools and systems as a, a national service. And I still absolutely believe in that. I'd be very happy to talk about it, but today I thought I'd spare you from that. And if I may, I'd also like to jump away from the theme a little bit or the brief a little bit, but just to the edge of the topic um, uh, and talk instead about why so many researchers are still not choosing to adopt better practices and why affecting change at a more fundamental level might be an important prerequisite for supporting research data management. And I think the reason's clear. We, uh, everyone knows the reason, we don't often discuss it, that despite all the work that's been done to promote open access and a more collaborative and altruistic approach to research, um, researchers are still locked into a vicious and competitive cycle of racing to publish in the best journals to get more citations, to get more funding, to do more research, to publish in the best journals, to get the citations, to get the funding and so on. It's incredibly competitive and stressful. And I think it's a system that does make it easier for established researchers to succeed. Um, and it presents an uphill struggle for, for many others. Um, and for people who are locked into this competitive culture, altruism is a risky proposition and collaboration is more about negotiation than it is about enthusiastic sharing of knowledge unless there's a real <coughs> excuse me tangible career benefit uh, in sharing then why give up those hard-won resources why give away more than you need to now obviously this enlightened community has a bigger picture view and understands the greater good that comes from sharing but sadly i think that the competitive attitude that i described is prevalent in groups and departments and institutions nationally and internationally. Um, <clears throat> so my job in the, the Gurdon Institute is to provide infrastructure and services to allow our researchers to do high quality and innovative research and to maintain their competitive advantage. It's a phrase that we use a lot. Um, we have a server room that's bulging with petabytes of awesome science stuff. And we look after it very well, if I say so myself. Um, but an essential part of um, of that infrastructure is, um, is a great big firewall that stops other departments from getting anywhere near our stuff. We are separated from biochemistry by a wooden door that's about that thick with a little window in it so we can see them, but, um, but they can't get anywhere near our stuff. And that's, it's not just a characteristic of the Gurdon Institute and its level of funding. I think most departments in Cambridge operate the same way, and I'm sure the same is true in, in many other institutions that they have physical security and access control systems and firewalls and identities and administrative structures that are all designed to make them self-contained and walls and networks and this proliferation of local infrastructures binds us all into small administrative units and I think that kind of topology um, reinforces the them and us culture as if uh, other departments were like other teams in a, a sports league for example um, it's probably not surprising, but it's interesting to me that researchers in the Garden Institute, for example, um, feel a strong affiliation to their department and also to um, research groups in other corners of the world that share their interest in fruit flies. But they don't feel the same strength of affiliation to the university or to their colleagues on the other side of that door to, to biochemistry. Um, so all of this is to say that, that based on my own observations around the University of Cambridge, um, Many researchers are content uh, to know that their data is safe and secure within their own walls, but making it discoverable to researchers outside of these walls is not a priority because the sense of affiliation is not there. Um, the benefits of sharing with people they don't know seem too abstract. Um, and because of this ingrained culture of competition, 
they're not all like that, of course. And, and at this point, I have to celebrate the, the fantastic work that OSC do and the data champions in Cambridge and the researchers that do subscribe to, to open research and excellent data, manage, data management practices. But there's still a long way to go. However, um, there are some things afoot in the School of Biological Sciences here in Cambridge that I think will create opportunities for some very positive change. Our head of school has laid out her vision for the school and includes some very interesting ideas and initiatives. Um, the most important of which I think is the introduction of research themes. So rather than organising our research under departmental titles, the school has described um, six main areas of research interest and academics and researchers will select themselves into these themes which will be managed by cross-departmental leadership teams. And, um, and where in the past prospective researchers would have to choose if they wanted to be a cell biologist in the zoology department or in the plant sciences department, our goal now is to try and reduce the distinction between departments and to try and stimulate a lot more movement and collaboration and cross-pollination within the school well, not only within the school, in fact, but part of the vision is to encourage cross-school collaborations too. So the departments will still exist, but this softening of the departmental boundaries should bring all kinds of benefits. We are hoping that it will substantially improve the quality and the experience for students because they'll benefit from a much broader and more inclusive um, teaching landscape that offers a more diverse range of perspectives. And we're hoping that it will reduce cliqueiness and increase openness within the research community and encourage new affiliations that reach out beyond the, the departmental walls. I'm sure you can see where I'm going. Um, I'm hoping that this soft structural change will promote some bigger picture awareness and a more collegial approach. Um, and that will trickle down into everyday practices, including research data management. Uh, another interesting development is a proposal for a cross-school research project that will investigate research culture in, in Cambridge and beyond, looking at factors such as the metrics that are used to evaluate researchers and research, um, looking at reward and recognition to understand how we might improve <coughs> excuse me, the way in which contributions at all levels within research teams are recognised, um, and looking at leadership and diversity in the research community. Um, there's a lot to consider. Um, and I really hope that the outcome of this work will provide some impetus to disrupt or at least soften that competitive cycle that I mentioned earlier and create a more open and collaborative research landscape. So there are lots of interesting changes on the way, I hope, and I think we've all learned a lot in the last nine months about how people adapt to change. Um, when lockdown started and the daily routine that we all took for granted suddenly changed, some people saw opportunities and started innovating and exploring new ways to work. Some people didn't um, or couldn't adapt and, and they're still struggling. And in the university community that I operate within, very many people who were previously completely entrenched in their normal ways of doing things and who would stubbornly resist um, any suggestion of change, suddenly started looking for leadership and guidance and cheap Zoom licenses. And they, um, they they became much more eager to embrace new ideas uh, and began rolling with changes rather than resisting those changes. And right now, people are becoming optimistic about getting back to their normal ways of life. But everyone uses the term new normal. Everyone's expecting change, uh, maybe even looking forward to change. And um, uh, even if they, they, they don't really know what that change is going to look like, this is a, a, it's a perfect time right now to plant new ideas and to help people to redefine normal. Um, and that's the, the key point that I'm trying to make, is that, that you can put in place the best resources and the best infrastructure and the best support systems, but if you haven't got buy-in from the researchers, it's unlikely to be successful. Um, we all know that cultural change is difficult, and for many, adopting better research data management practices amounts to a substantial cultural change. But change is happening all around us all the time, and that creates opportunities. And um, it doesn't even really matter how relevant those changes are because I think it's the process of change that makes people receptive. If you can catch people's imagination while they're riding that wave and they're open to, or at least adapting to change, you just might be able to show them a better way and make them want to change. Then you can provide them with the support that they need to change. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening. Now I can talk about servers and stuff if you really want. <laughs>
I'll tell you what, Al, if we run out of time at the end, then you can you can um, <laughs> you can preach about your national infrastructure. Okay, I will. careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, I think I think this is really interesting that you bring this up because this is a common theme that is pervading throughout all of these webinars. And interestingly, that the the one on the first day, which I know you couldn't attend, and I'm happy to fill you in on it. We held a poll on the first day, which was asking what some of the what is what is the main factor that people think uh, is inhibiting good research data practices. <clears throat> and interestingly, that came out top in that poll was, was that they're not embedded in research culture. So that, I was not expecting that answer actually. And we had other things in there like researchers don't have enough time, it's not a priority, too much pressure to publish fast or frequently. I mean, they're all tied together. They're, they're not mutually exclu exclusive elements. But within that, research culture came up uh, on top as where, where the problem lies. So I actually think, because this is, this is totally relevant to how we support researchers and research data management. Um, so I'd love to have um, Marta's perspective and Tao's perspective on this. So, for example, is there, is there anything that uh, the, the funder can do to help address this? So, actually, I'll go with, with you first, Tata, if you don't mind, to see yeah, what your thoughts are on this. What can we do? Um, I, I like to say that we'd like to be led by the community. So, you need to give me ideas and you need to give me some thoughts. Um, where we have got to at the moment is that we need a, a, a structure which is not center heavy. So it's not dictating as it were, but that one that, that it would be almost like, I hate to say this, but almost like a mixture of carrots and sticks. So on the one hand you have, uh, well, if you're funded by the AHRC, then um, we would, it, it would be uh, a requirement to deposit your research data um, somewhere. Um, and at the other end of that, um, we would need to provide funding for said research data repositories, trusted data repo um, digital repositories for that to happen, as well as the people um, to, um, to, to, to curate the data and, and make sure that it remains um, 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 FAIR fair compliant um, after it has been deposited and doesn't just sort of fall off a cliff. So that is, that is one, that, that's the stick element, I suppose. Um, the current element, I think, is that we, we would like, I, I think one of the things that we've recognised, particularly within the arts and humanities ecosystem, is that there is um, a lot of stress around lack of funding uh, and a lack of support and everybody doing too much and everybody being too busy. And so you have some universities which have um, a little bit of resource, they squeeze out a little bit of resource to, to, to try to enable a change in culture, but it's not really supported at our end. So should there be, I suppose this is a question to everybody else, should we have a scheme that HEIs can bid to um, that provides resource to build communities of practice um, and, and to try to enable sustain change? That, that's, a, that's a question more than an answer, but I mean, you know, that's, a, does that help a little? Yes, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm all for funds to help build communities of practice. I think this is very important. Um, Marta, do you have any thoughts on this question? Uh, yes, thank you. I think uh, just coming back first to that, uh, that issue of that we need cultural change, I completely and wholeheartedly agree with, with you all that we are not there yet. But here I wanted to reflect also on the selfish reasons of going, doing proper data management, you know, and while people say, oh, it takes time, but actually in, eventually it saves you time. And I think you have among the University of Cambridge, you have Florian Markovitz, who is this big advocate of selfish reason for working reproducibly. And basically highlighting, you know, even while if you, the only thing you, you care is to have that X many papers in like X impact factor journals, then still doing data management better just saves you a lot of time because you yourself don't have to find and struggle where is your data, how this data led to this figure and so on and so forth. So 
that's the selfish reasons that uh, I would really recommend if you have not uh, attended Florian's talk to read some of his papers. It's quite inspirational. But what's also important, and I completely agree, is to change that rewards and recognition system. And that applies not only you know, to how we hire researchers, how we award grants, so there is work for research institutions, you know, who do we want to have as part of the teams? How do we work with researchers and research team? How do we reward teachers? How do we reward researchers who produce a lot of papers? How do we reward data managers who are part of that research group? So basically, to how do we give team science, team research, if you prefer, proper attribution for all the different kinds of work that everybody contributes. We don't have to have 10 people within one group who are doing all the same things and have the same type of skills, but we should really be promoting diversity and inclusivity and different career choices that people might have a preference for. So there is definitely a role for the universities. I think there is a big role for founders indeed, and I'm happy to say again that in the Netherlands, uh, one of our biggest funders, uh, NVO, is really promoting that work in investing into rewards and recognition. For example, they have banned H index uh, on, on researcher CV. They can't talk about their publications anymore, but the impact of their work, which I think is quite an interesting development. And there is also a lot of work happening on the European level within the European Open Science Cloud, who also really promote that agenda, how we should be better evaluating researchers. There's no good answers yet. I think people are experimenting with different change of practices, different types of trying to look at recruitment, at reward and recognition, at promotion criteria, at rewarding research grants. But I think we do need those kind of experimentations. And I'm also happy that uh, you, you mentioned DORA beforehand there. I think collecting case studies from various institutions all over the world, funders, but also uh, research institutions in terms of what they do to change this culture. So I think, of course, we are not there yet, but I'm happy to see that this is now the mainstream. Everybody seems to be talking about it. You know, you at Cambridge, we at Delft, I think in general, the momentum is there. So hopefully in five years time, that will be better. Okay, so I think a nice a nice uh, question that somebody has made uh, together the comment that leads on from that. Um, it is it, it touches on the question of responsibility. So who's responsible? Um, and the question that person has is who has the authority to force the change, and what means do they have to do that? And this is a very broad question. And they, they mentioned that, you know, the last days, presumably with these webinars, that the ones who have the for, have this authority are kind of the journals, the senior researchers, the, the funders. And do you think, and I guess in relation to this, do you think that responsibilities are sort of being shifted around the place so that nobody, nobody actually takes the responsibility? Marta, yeah, please. <laughs> I would put it the other way around, you know, if we are shifting responsibilities, I think everyone, every, every, everyone who is part of the ecosystem has a responsibility. And of course, you can drive change differently if you are a PhD student and, you know, discovers, let's say, a beautiful tool for data management, it can improve the practices in your research environment. And you can inflict change differently if you are the provost chancellor of the university. So we have different stakeholders and different things which are within our remit. But I honestly be, believe that each one of us can really make a substantial contribution. If you are a PI of the group, show to your colleagues, show to your researchers how important good data management is for your budget, this and grant proposal. If you are a funder, of course, you can have all these initiatives at your disposal. But if you are a PhD student, you can also try to change the culture in a bottom-up manner. And we had numerous examples of that as well. So I really believe that, you know, while we are thinking of, of trying to put the responsibilities on somebody else's shoulders, we can try to turn that argument and everybody can do something to promote that cultural change. Al, yes, please. I was going to talk about the, the, this tension that has always existed within, um, within the university structure, um, where the university seeks to try to manage from the top uh, and the academics uh, and their academic freedom um, uh, demands complete flexibility and control from the bottom and in between there's no man's land where people try and get things done but um with great difficulty um so i think uh I, I've, I've argued in the past or not argued i've suggested in the past that um that a university could mandate 
um, certain practices. And there was such a sharp intake of breath, I was almost sucked off my chair um, because it's, it's never going to work. But I do think that, that funding agencies, though, do have um, they do have a little bit of uh, room to become harder in their approach. And I'm very pleased to see that some funding agencies are starting to audit compliance with um, data management plans, for example. Um, uh, they could become a bit more hard-nosed in the way they, um, they, they, they require um, good data, data management practice to be demonstrated. The danger is that, that then the response to that will simply be a box-ticking exercise. A uh, box ticking approach rather than you know, a genuine cultural change towards wanting to do the right thing the right way. So we have quite a few comments coming in on the, the chat about this, about, about uh, funders being stricter, as you just suggested with this. Um, so, I mean, Tao Tao, what, what do you think? I mean, it, to be able to do a data management plan as part of an HRC application, not, not all the, the grant schemes, but most of them. Mm. There's only been a recent, I think it was what, spring 2018 it came in. So it's only been a recent thing for HRC. I mean, what, what are discussions like at HRC in terms of monitoring compliance with DMPs? And is this ever thought of as being a good idea? And how would it happen in practice? I, I think it's partly <clears throat> the, um, you know, the, the the sort of introduction of DMPs and <clears throat> the um, need ha that has has triggered a, a, a conversation about the intervention, a, a sort of a bigger intervention on the part of AHRC and 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 a greater sort of more coordinated effort on our part um, to, um, to 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 sort of steward the data for want of a a, a better phrase. I think. We are, I wouldn't want to preempt anything, but I think we're moving towards a model where we will, you know, providing um, funding comes through for the establishment or funding of repositories and for, and, and, and for new posts, data curators, um, and for these uh, sort of centers, uh, national centers, or for, for training and, and capacity building, providing that comes through, then there is likely to be an accompanying policy change towards mandating and therefore also auditing um, 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 and sort of managing uh, and, and sort of checking compliance, as it were. Um, uh, and um, the idea is that there will be um, uh, um, standards, unified standards. We won't be creating um, brand new standards, but I've been told there are plenty of them knocking around already. But there will be standards that we will expect our grant holders to adhere to. Um, um, going forward. So, so in a way, you know, if you look at the sort of research council's funding landscape, um, you have um, you know, the, the big science councils, EP, SRC and, and MRC, which are, which are literally funded to the tune of tenfold of, of what AHRC gets for its core budget. And therefore there will be um, restrictions and there will be constraints on what we can do we're working hard to change that because we we we, we recognise that this is uh, uh, an area that we, we where um, there should be more intervention from us, but which um, there has not been um, up till now or in the past. I think this. Thank you. I think this ties a bit to one of the questions we had uh, from one of the people who registered uh, in advance. And uh, they asked whether they whether you think that um, I think this is a question actually for all of you, but but I'll start with you as from the funders' perspective, Tao Tao. And it's whether RDM so skills training should be um, begun at doctoral level, and if so, in what form? I mean, this is something that we offer at, at Cambridge. Um, it's not it's not mandatory, um, and I think some some departments. Uh, favourite a lot a lot more so than others um, so it'd be really interesting to get your thoughts on this because this this feeds into Marta's benefits of good research data management that it's that it's not a chore that it's not a disadvantage to do it but actually ultimately it's a massive advantage to practice good research data management um, 
and and to just build on that we also have a, um, a perspective of a PhD student uh, in the chat box who's who's who said that there's no short-term interest in spending time to manage their research data um, and that there is competition the competition will select those who publish a lot not those who make efforts so there is this real battle going on here between that you know Al has talked about in terms of research culture and so on so is the, is the simple solution just to make it make it mandatory whatever discipline you're in so RDM training at, at the doctoral level right from the very beginning if not earlier I, I mean we we, we AHRC's work starts in terms of research support at the doctoral level and not before that I think it should start before personally I think the earlier it is embedded into uh, consciousness the, 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 the more likely it is the less likely it is to be met um, with resistance and the more likely the advantages will be felt and experienced and then you set up a kind of a kind of a virtual cycle hopefully or virtual ecosystem virtuous ecosystem where people begin to do it as a matter of course um, I don't think it's just doctoral training or early career researchers that should be uh, should be eligible for training, though I think it is also established researchers, people who are possibly less familiar with, um, you know, the use of digital tools and, and the advantages that it may bring um, to their research or the new approaches and perspectives and methodologies that may arise from it. So it should be it really should be for everybody. I mean, my, if given my my head for you know um, a, a research, a digital research infrastructure um, for arts and humanities, um, it, it it should be training that is available to anyone, and and some uh, not but not just sort of being passive and saying it's available, but also a model where people go out and actually engage and demonstrate the advantages and actually cultivate and grow it. But I, I'd rather not sort of differentiate between you know, the doctoral student and the, and the early career and the postdoc and the established um, because they all have something to add to the, um, um, the, the sort of the system and bring to the table. Thank you. Uh, Al or Marta, do you have anything to add? I can. I, but... I um, absolutely agree. I think the earlier big burden. You go ahead, Al. I, I was just going to say, I, I agree. The earlier, the better, I think. Um, it's a fundamental part of learning how to be a researcher. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think catch them really young and, and it becomes a part of the way they think about um, undertaking research right from the very start. I, I go for undergraduate. Um, uh, as soon as you start thinking about research, um, it should be built into everything that you do. I wholeheartedly agree, if I may add, with Etauta and with Al as well. At, at, at our university, we do training for PhD students that uh, about compulsory or not. It's not compulsory at the university level, but some faculties make training compulsory for their PhD students. And in addition, we also have a requirement for a data management plan as part of that first year VIVA go, no go a review, as some people see after the first year of the PhD. Plus, PhD students are asked to deposit their data before they are able to graduate from their PhD. So there are those checks in there. And we've noticed that we hope also that there is lots of interest from PhD supervisors because of that. The PhD supervisor is the person who is ultimately responsible for saying, yes, I agree, this was a good enough data management plan. So that really engages them with that process as well. But I wholeheartedly agree. I think training should start much earlier. And we are doing some pilots now to how to embed data management training in master student education. And we try to use the train the trainer approach. So basically train some uh, teachers who are teaching master students how to embed data management training in a disciplinary fashion within the existing curricula for master students. But that's just something we are starting. But indeed, I think that training is extremely important to give people the skills to do the right thing. Okay, thank you. Um, one of one of the questions that I had, which sort of links all these things together, is perhaps I mean, Marta, you, TU Delft seems very very well provisioned for in terms of all of this through 
a huge amount of effort to sort of get it started and excellent management as well. There may be people in this webinar who from much smaller institutions that maybe don't have research data teams or um, perhaps there's one person doing everything to do with research data for that institution, if that. Um, how, how can perhaps those smaller institutions or those less well-provisioned institutions best kick off um, research data management support? when there are, there are not very many resources. So this is a question for, for everybody because obviously, you know, funding is essential. You can't do it without funding um, or people to do it. So perhaps we could just sort of finish with briefly just some words on this from the three of you and then we'll move on to our poll. Al, you can go first, yeah. I, I'll just start then by, by saying, I think what Marta and Rosie managed to achieve here in, in Cambridge um, was very much I, you know, as I'm done with pocket change, really, I, with, with my feeling, um, but they managed to harness such a lot of energy, um, volunteer energy from around the campus, um, and they achieved a massive amount with actually very little um, input in terms of resource. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Marta, but um, uh, it, it didn't really take very much to, to spark that enthusiastic volunteer response. You're, you're right, Ali, in that way you can start with whatever resources you have available to you and gather case studies. That's something that, that convinces, you know, your senior executives, researchers about the value of that. And as I mentioned, you know, of course, different resources can be at your disposal. And as I mentioned, you know, we started with the data stewards pilot, but we initially had central team who was just gathering requests for support and presenting this to the executive board saying, we can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do that, researchers want that kind of support. If we are serious about what we preach, we really have to invest in some support. Initially, we got only the, the funding for the data stewards, I made it short, but it was for 0.5 FTE per faculty for just one year. And that has been quickly increased because the demand was so huge. So really start slow with, I agree with you all, with whatever resources you have available at disposals, gather some case studies and that will start from there. Thank you. And, and Tao Tao, I think this builds into your communities of communities of practice that you talked about before. Yes, I, I think um, you know, I would love to hear from all of you um, about what it, it, it's it's quite it's quite easy to say we need funding and we need resource. It's a little bit more difficult to uh, become much more specific about it and say we need resource in order to build you know, sustained cultural change in research practice. And if that is the case, then then what is your vision for it? And what would you like to, us to fund you for? Um, because, you know, once you have that, that conversation gets going, then we have, we have something specific to start on. So would it be this? Would it be a pilot first for two years? And then you'd gather the evidence and review it, and then we could make it more permanent or a five-year thing. And could you turn it into a regional centre or could you turn it into a, a national centre? And how do you link up with other communities of practice or other centres um, um, and, and, and do we then also provide funding for conferences so that you know the, train, the, the, the trainers of, of, of the training and the champions can meet and discuss and share you know should there be a network there so it really be, being a little bit more specific about the extent and nature of the intervention would be really helpful. Okay I think that's really lovely optimistic way to end this webinar um, and hopefully the poll I'm going to launch is not a less optimistic, <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to cancel that out. So I'm just going to um, launch the poll here. There are, there's one question and two answers. You can only choose one of the answers. Um, so if you could make your vote and because I'm aware of the time, um, I would just like to say thank you so much to all three speakers today for, for having such a wonderful discussion about actually many, many different topics and from, the, from the, big, the big umbrella of research culture down to the more specifics. Um, I really appreciate you spending your time with us today. And thank you so much also to all the participants who have attended today's webinar and for um, contributing some fantastic comments and opinions into the chat. This is really great. Um, uh, Maria has posted, um, some, some final statements uh, for you. Um, 
as this webinar is ending and within there, there is a very short feedback form about today's event. It's just a couple of questions. It should only take a minute or two. So we'd really appreciate your feedback on that. Um, so please do fill that in if you can. Um, so just looking at the poll, um, I can share it, I will share it now. All right. So I think the, right, everybody, everybody see that? Okay, so the overwhelming percentage is that people think that individual researchers should learn how to manage their own data well. Um, I think, I think the reality is it'd be lovely to have a combination of all different approaches actually very much like how Marta presented, but that's actually really positive to have those responses. Um, okay, thank you very much everybody for attending and we have the final webinar of Cambridge Data Week happening tomorrow which is on peer review and data so that's at 11 o'clock tomorrow so if you can attend and haven't signed up yet then there is still time. Okay thank you very much everybody, take care, bye bye. <laughs>